Welcome to Leadership Delic Season 3. My name is Sebastian Fouillard. Join us every week to discover how deep spiritual experiences have influenced people's leadership and how they build a better future for themselves, for their family, for their community, and at work. We cover a variety of topics from yoga to mindfulness, meditation, prayer, creativity, brain mapping, alternative medicine such as psychedelics, and so much more. By learning from these experiences, we can raise our understanding of leadership and build a better future together. If you're a returning listener, thank you so much for your support. It means the world to me. And if you have time, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or share this with a friend. Thank you and enjoy the program. This week, meet Luke Jensen, founder and CEO of NeuroEnlightenment, a company at the intersection of neuroscience and plant shamanism. We worked with Luke and his team during the Sacred Creativity Retreat to measure the impact of ayahuasca ceremonies and creativity workshops on our guests. We were blown away with the results. Luke is from Nebraska and joined the U.S. Marines when he was 18. After returning from his deployment to Afghanistan in 2011, Luke was searching for meaning in life. He experienced ayahuasca, which changed and reshaped his perspective of reality. This sent him on a quest to Peru, where he spent time living in the jungle with Shipibo healers. Luke started learning about QEG brain mapping and different types of brain training. He eventually became passionate about the potential of brain mapping and training in conjunction with plant medicines. This led him to the creation of Neuroenlightenment. We cover Luke's personal journey from the Marines to his deep soul work that followed, what led him to brain mapping and what is seen during his work at the intersection of neurofeedback and spirituality. This is a fascinating interview and after talking with Luke and using brain mapping ourselves during the retreat, I'm convinced brain mapping is a tool with huge potential in the psychedelic space. Enjoy the show, this is one not to be missed and see you on the other side. Luke, welcome, it's such a pleasure to have you here today, how are you doing? Doing really well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to watch your journey. Like we met, I think like four or five years ago at a an ayahuasca ceremony, and yeah. uh, at the time you were really into like runes and 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 you even gave me like a, a painting on one of yeah. the runes. And, uh, it was really special. And uh, we met in Seattle. Yeah. And then somehow we met back here. Yeah. Um, thanks to the projects you're doing right now. So can you share a little bit about what you've been up to and uh, before we dive in your journey? Yeah, so I've been back and forth from Peru for about five, six years now. And this time I've been here for a year and a half. And now that I'm in Peru, I'm doing what's called QEGs, brain mapping, and uh, neurofeedback brain training. Okay. And we specialize in the spiritual realm of both okay. of these. Okay, that sounds really cool, and we're gonna dive a little bit deeper okay. into that later. But like, how did you how did you end up there? Because <laughs> I've been like from from what I understand, you, you were from in the Marines, yeah, and now you're in Peru doing brain mapping. I mean, that's I I wouldn't expect that. No, I, I hear that a lot actually, and sometimes I surprise myself <laughs> how my life has changed and how I got here. Um, I was in the Marines for eight years. I deployed to Afghanistan in 2011. Um, and when I got back, the Marine Corps wasn't gonna be my career for me. The military wasn't gonna be a career. Mm -hmm. And I was an officer path and that was my goal in life and different things happened. And uh, it was kind of a shock to the system. I wasn't sure if I really wanted to do the military anymore. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I had no, like, no idea what I wanted to do. I felt really lost. Yeah, yeah. And most things, um, coming back home from being, I was in the infantry, yeah. coming back home um, from being outside the wire every day. Where's your home? Uh, Omaha, Nebraska, okay. and there wasn't a whole lot that really interested me compared to the lifestyle I was living. Um, normal business job wasn't really for me. Um, actually, an old friend called me up. He, he has a small railroad company. Yeah. He asked me if I want to work for him. And at the time, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I work <laughs> for a friend. They're like, I don't have anything else going on. So I started working on the railroad and uh, I started traveling the country for a number of years. To kind what, of just, what, what do you do on the railroad? We build railroad crossings. Okay. So we build, um, you know, arms come down, lights flash, and we go around. We're a small crew that goes in the country building railroad crossings for different, like, usually short line railroads that don't oh, have their own. Cool. So it was, it was a cool job for a while because like, I worked with old college friends yeah. and I uh, got to see the world, see the country a lot. Yeah. And it was good for me because I don't think I was ready for any kind of, like, office job. And, yeah. Um, it was never going to be like a long-term career for me, but it was a, a space where I could settle and kind of yeah. find myself. Yeah. Um, and during that time, I 
a friend referenced a Joe Rogan podcast. Uh -huh. Yeah, so some, it's funny how people find the space through that yeah. venue. And um, it was Joe Rogan, Amber Lyon. It was a number of years ago now. Yeah. It was a really good podcast. And she, I think she did two. One, she talked about her experiences in um, um, the Middle East, reporting for CNN, and she came back and told how her life changed through ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And the interview impressed me so much. And I thought, like, well, I'm not sure what I'm doing with my life right now at all, so I'll try that. Okay. And I came down, I think it was seven years ago, my first time doing ayahuasca. Yeah. And it was a life-changing experience. Um, Is it, that's where you met Kunti and, and Chris? And, the first no? time, seven years ago, I went to, um, it was Pulse Tours in the jungle. So okay. the second time I met Kunti and Chris, okay. and then eventually through them I met you. Yeah. Um, but at the time, you know, coming from that world, the Marines, and no experience around any of this stuff, just jumping around the deep end, um, it really, I'll say shook the system or cracked the egg. Yeah. I could, um, I felt like the reality I was in before was much different that yeah. I was kind of living in my own box or maybe in a way that we're trained to see things in the West. We have a certain linear view of the world yeah. um, and it was basically shattered. And it took me a while to adjust to that because you see these things, you have these experiences and then it's integrating them. And what does it mean? Is this real? What happened there? Yeah, yeah. And over time, I came back to Peru. I came back a second time. That's where I went to, that's where I met Chris and Kunti. Yeah. And got along well yeah. with them. Well, before we get there, I want to go back to the, the jungle yeah. and, and kind of your, your first experience. Um, <clears throat> like, can, can you paint the picture of like where the center was, like how, how the ceremonies took place and, yeah, and a little bit of, of kind of like how um, some of the learnings you get and, and, and things that got shattered uh, in the process? Yeah, it was a really special time um, because uh, the center was brand new. It was Pulse Tours in the Jungle. Dan Cleland started it and they were just building. And I think it was the first New Year's Eve ceremony. Um, so it's a 10 day retreat and there's three ayahuasca ceremonies, there's only four ayahuasca ceremonies in 10 days. And just leaving the country, I mean, I've been to different countries before, but going down to the jungle, that alone, that immersion, that difference from the Western world, the normal day to day yeah. is really healthy. So I think we were in the jungle for four days living and we would go on boat rides and we'd experience the jungle and, um, that itself was very therapeutic. Yeah. Um, that I think novelty is very important for the human being's experience. Yeah. A routine can be a killer. Yeah. So when you go and experience novelty, I, I think it's just amazing. I think the neuroscience backs that up as well. Um, and then I remember actually telling one of the facilitators there, like, wow, this is an amazing experience. I, mean, I haven't even done ayahuasca yet. And she goes, well, wait till you try ayahuasca. <laughs> and yeah, she was right. So, um, and at the time, I was, this is a really big experience for me. I'm coming down to Peru. I've never been here before. Yeah. So I did all the preparation, the fasting. Yeah. Um, I think I ate every other day and a very oh, vegetarian wow. diet for six weeks and everything else they tell you to yeah. do. And uh, I was very disciplined. And it's kind of funny because ayahuasca, say it gives you what you need, not what you want. Mm -hmm. So I came in, meditative stance, <laughs> ready to go. And it was all dark in the room and everyone had this, I didn't know at the time because I thought everyone was having the same experience. I had nothing happened to me the first time, yeah. but everyone had these really powerful experiences. My, yeah. uh, my friend had confirmation in the afterlife. Oh, wow. This other guy was addicted to Percocets. He was cured. You know, I'm like, and nothing happened to me. I was like, what the hell? I've been doing all this training. <laughs> and I think that was ayahuasca saying like, Hey, you know, you, you were kind of coming at your pace and yeah, the yeah, medicine yeah. takes a little bit to get into you. Um, and the next night, the second night I, I drank again, they gave me a little bigger dose because they knew the first night nothing happened. Yeah. And I could tell right away a big experience was coming on. And uh, it was a beautiful place in the jungle. It's all on 20 foot stilts because of floods in the jungle in the oh. area. So you almost feel like you're on an old sea ship or something. So I was walking to the latrine, I'm going up the door and it felt like these, like these walkways were like swaying. And wow. yeah, it was very, very, psychedelic experience, I suppose, yeah, yeah. a very powerful experience. And I walked to the bathroom and 
and uh, I see colors going up through the walls, the colors I've never seen before in the wood. Like, okay, Luke, this is, I've never seen this happen. And then I, I'm walking back to the Mloka across the same walkway. Yeah. And they tell you you want to stay in the Mloka because energy is protected there. It's a safe space. It's not necessarily other spaces are bad. It's just that's where the healing energy is at. Well, I want to stop and look at the stars for a bit. No. So I turn, around, turn to the side. And it's in the middle of the jungle, middle, yeah. middle of the Amazon. Yeah. There's no light. So you can see the Milky Way going across the sky perfectly. And wow. you see all the stars. And I could see all the stars connected. And I looked down into the jungle. And I could see... It's hard to describe, but the best way I can describe it, it's like the world of Avatar. Yeah. And underneath that, I saw these red lines of energy connecting everything. Wow. And this overwhelming sense of awe that everything in the world's connected yeah. and that all life is connected and the stars and the jungle connected in distance. Um, it reminds me of those things you read in history books, like this spiritual rapture yeah. that I've never experienced, just read about. I felt like I was having that at that moment. And the next thing I know, I purge. It's part of the ayahuasca yeah. experience. So I purge over the side of the, the railing and it's 20 feet high. Oh. And what I see is this huge hole opening in the earth and all this black liquid falling into this hole like a thousand miles into the earth. This overwhelming sense that the earth was taking all this negative energy mm. that I had accumulated and taking it into itself. Wow. And yeah, I stepped back and wow, was overwhelmed by this experience. And uh, one of the facilitators, a really cool guy, he was into the, he studied a Zen monastery and he was into the runes yeah. and Nordic tradition as well. He's like, hey brother, how you doing? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> and uh, he's like, well, when you're ready, Go ahead and go back to the Mloka. I'm like, okay. So I go back to the Mloka and um, I saw the shaman healing everybody with lines of energy going into wow. everybody, like transparent healing energy. And it was almost, it was very a celebratory experience, very joyful. And I saw like parts of my body that have been injured in the past, like healing. Yeah. Um, they weren't cured the next day, but I could see like energy going into those spots. Um, so that was an experience that, like, okay, one that was very powerful and very insightful. And, and that experience, so much about it didn't seem like just a hallucination. Yeah. It wasn't just like a swirl or colors. Yeah, yeah. It was actual things happening there. And it really made me think of like existence and energy. And there's much more going on than we think there is. Um, at the time, it was a shock, but the more I've been in this world and experiencing these things, it's just the way it is now. Yeah. How did you um, uh, correlate this with everything you'd been through before? Like, uh, how did you integrate that moving forward? It was interesting because I talked to uh, Dan, the person that built it. I go, for all the trauma I had and everything I experienced before that, because I feel like it all led to this point. Yeah. And he goes, you'd be surprised how many people tell us that. That feels like the suffering, the trauma, the, the things I had to go through were for a reason. And from there on, it changed how, changed my value system, how I, what values I want to work on, what I, what I want to see myself, what I want to do in the world. Um, what kind of impact I want to make. Yeah. In nature of reality, um, it became really obvious that we have energy field, we have a soul, and that we need to keep these things healthy and, yeah. and be acknowledge them. Yeah. And it's, no one really tells you how to do that in, in, the, in the Western world. At least no one really told me. Wow. I, I, so, okay, so you've got this, this amazing moment uh, yeah. this um you know experience shattering moment where you 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 see everything differently yeah. um you go back home after that yeah when you go back home 
like was that what we had what did you do <laughs> <laughs> well i think i told my friends about my experience i think a lot of them thought i was crazy well like, yeah <laughs> i mean you were in nebraska yeah you went back to nebraska yeah. and then you tell them about your yeah, know, yeah. earth shattering yeah, ayahuasca most, experience yeah most people haven't heard of ayahuasca especially at the time and i think my friends on the railroad thought like oh you know luke's doing this crazy stuff in the jungle <laughs> you know so i mean all organic food and i think i'm a little hippie you know maybe i am a little bit but um I I started playing like, what do I want to do? I want to come, I want to eventually come back. Yeah, I want to see more of this world. Like this seems like a, a mystery that he knows there. I want to start trying to figure it out. Yeah, what does all that mean? Um, I also kind of had my own theories. I started researching plants in North America, like different spiritual plants. I um, I contacted a local Omaha tribe and started going to fire ceremonies and working with like. Uh, Lakota and Omaha uh, fire ceremonies and sweat lodges and a much more spiritual path at home yeah. anywhere I could full moon ceremonies stuff like that how did it feel inside of you as you were going through that like from the life before I was cat to the life after I was cat like you know the the trauma you had before yeah. the like how did that evolve um I think when I look at one, I always am I always interested because like I'm so happy that this plant medicines are in my life. They've yeah. changed my life. It's hard to imagine me going through the world without it yeah. now. I'm I'm so grateful. Yeah. Um, I also day to day try to appreciate every day and try to think more consciously of how I'm living my life, what I'm doing in the world. Yeah. Um, are there rituals that you have, like daily rituals or things that you do? Or yeah, no, I. Uh, so I'm saying Norse runes, and I like wearing runes. I like different different runes. I wear different days, yeah. and um, like different. There's many kind of different spiritual modalities, but ayahuasca opened me up to one spiritual method. So I want to look into more of like the Northern European uh, spiritual ideas and methods, mm -hmm. and the runes called out to me right away i knew about them but now they start clicking more i start understanding them more um and each rune you can focus on and meditate on for a week or longer yeah. and you can challenge yourself um so i started thinking more deeply about different spiritual philosophies yeah. i started reading the bhagavad gita and um, vedic philosophy and different things like that and I changed what I read. So I tried to, so much, there's so much stuff in the world today. Yeah. And it's all out just, every day there's a new news item. Every day there's, you know, articles being written, but most of it has really little meaning. And you won't remember it a week or a month or a year after that. Yeah. Um, so I started reading more spiritual books, you know, Taoism and things like this. Yeah. And I, I looked as a way to increase my spiritual health. Um, and that just reading that those texts even though i might not be as efficient or expert as some people just reading that um i think improved my, my spiritual health yeah yeah good good and so now we're maybe four or five years from now and you're coming back you're coming back to peru and you're you're meeting with with our common friends chris and kunti yeah um were you still trying to come back to Peru at the time or were you just kind of like exploring the world? And so I was working on the railroad company and like I said, it was for the time, it was great. Um, and since my friend owned the company, it gave me a little leeway. So I talked to him like, hey, is it all right if I take off for like six months and come back and work? And you can't do that usually. But he's like, yeah, I don't know. Okay, whatever, you can do that. <laughs> and it really... Um, allowed me the financial resources to come back and forth. So I was I couldn't prove for a while, I'll do some ayahuasca. Um, I lived in the jungle for a long time. Um, my good friend Bryce, he's trained to be a shaman and he's serving medicine now. Mm -hmm. um, I'd visit him, I met him in the jungle. And a lot of times it was deep diets. When you do a diet in the jungle, a diet is when you combine ayahuasca with a certain plant and you learn the spirits of those plants and you have a really strict diet. And you're in the jungle too, you're in the heat bugs, insects, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. It's very challenging. Um, but the rewards spiritually are going to be great. Yeah. And so I, come, I came back and forth 
did that, did that for a number of years. Um, not straight for a number of years, but come back for like a few months here, a few months there. And always in my mind, I was trying to figure out like, well, what's my place in all this? What do I want to do? Yeah. So I, I could see that every time it came down, I felt like it was a better me. Like that. I think what I experienced in the military, um, I've written the books, a shaman's call, what they call soul loss. A part of you is taken, mm-hmm. an essence of you. The shamans go into the underworld and retrieve that and bring it back. Um, I felt that part of the essence of me was was lost. Yeah. I was completely me. I wasn't this as a lively of a person anymore. I didn't interact like with people like I would, would have liked to. And it seemed like it was a struggle to do those things. Um, I felt like over time, those parts of me that I was either separated from or soul lost, as I would say, mm-hmm. were reintegrated. And... The new me that emerged was much stronger than what was before. Hmm. Do, you, do you still stay in touch with people in the Marines that, that you knew? and like, Yeah, uh, the Marine Corps, it was a great experience. And I am really lucky the people I met, um, great friends. Do you share with them what you've been through? Yeah, no, I want br- hopefully soon I'll bring some down, some friends down oh, to experience some of this. Um, you saw me kind of lose track of a little bit or don't talk to, but I know they're always there. I can reach out to them and some... You know, I, I still keep in track on a regular yeah. basis. And eventually, I see my work working with veterans mm. and exposing them to this. Because um, I think there's lots of healing to be done in the world. And I think for a veteran myself, that oftentimes it takes kind of shock at the system. I mean, I think meditation and these things are really powerful, but sometimes it takes like yeah. a really strong dose of ayahuasca to shake things up to uh, be moving on the path you want. Yeah. Yeah, no, one of my guests used to say, uh, the, the deeper the wound, the stronger the medicine. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of deep wounds. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting because when I first started, I had a lot of deep wounds and it was deep soul work. Yeah. Like looking into those parts of myself, healing deep wounds. And it wasn't, Ayahuasca is often very beautiful, but it can also be challenging. And I had a lot of challenging ceremonies. But every one of those I appreciate. Every one of those I came out of the other side. And every one of those showed me who I was. Um, so after leaving the Marine Corps and some of the things that happened, I felt like I, uh, I failed. I, I didn't live up to what I wanted, that, mm. that career I wanted. Even though I didn't see myself, I couldn't. You know, that's, part of me didn't want it anymore, but part of me still did. It was also that question of identity. Who are you? When you leave the military, so many people have issues with that. Yeah. Because in the military, you're your tribe, your yeah. team, your squad. Um, so defining yourself. And then those challenging experiences really showed me, like, well, Luke, you know, <laughs> you made it through it. You still got it. Yeah. And each one of those, I felt stronger. Um, nowadays, it's much more laid back, I would say, for yeah. me. I don't have the deep soul work to do. Yeah. Which is it's nice. No, it's been fun to, even in the last four or five years, even though it was after that, it's been fun to kind of, or fun. It's been, you know, a joy to watch you kind of just change and adjust and find your path. Um, so. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I've really enjoyed that because you don't really necessarily see people like really manifesting like something so different. Yeah. All the time. No, I'm, there's many levels to that. Um, if you told me 10, 15 years ago that I'd be in the jungle doing psychedelic drugs with a crazy shaman, I, I would, there's no way we would believe you. Like, this is crazy. This is nuts, you know? And even now, I kind of reflect on, like, you know, look, how'd you get here? Um, but I wouldn't change any of it. Yeah. I mean, it's been this beautiful journey. And I think in the end, your soul's always guiding you. Yeah. Is that the consciousness inside of you that that inner voice. Um, and over time, I've gotten better listening to it, listen to it. Also, over time, I realized if you don't listen to it, you can be in trouble. And yep. for many years, I didn't listen to it, and it caused me a lot of heartache. Um, I kept doing the same patterns mm. and not almost like forcing things instead of just like, like the Taoist way of yeah. going with the flow, going with the universe, yeah. going with the Tao, yeah. um, going with your soul. 
So you, you were following your soul and then you ended up in brain mapping, territory yeah. brain training. Like what, how did, how did you go from exploring to brain mapping and brain training? So we'll go serendipity actually. Uh, my friend, Erica QB in Omaha, Nebraska, was one of the first people to do neurofeedback, neurotherapy, brain training, neuromodulation in the area. And she's really good and I was just interested in it. And so I would buy small devices myself 10 years ago and just start training my own brain, mostly to relieve um, my own suffering I was having. Most people didn't know what I was, I don't think anyone really knew what I was going through. I kept it all inside. Mm. Everyone's like, you know, we had, I remember telling my mom years later, like, man, we had no idea. Uh, but I was never diagnosed with PTSD, but something along those lines or trauma accumulates. And what I would describe it as is like, there's many parts to it, but there's like a constant tension in my body, constant, almost so much where day to day tasks were becoming challenging. And this would, got worse over time, wasn't getting better. So I was researching all kinds. I was eating organic, I was doing yoga, I was doing all kinds of different methods. I don't want to go the prescription drug route. I don't want to go, because yeah. I, I didn't, I saw limitations in that. Um, I never, you know, maybe I should have, but I never reached out to anybody. This is my own thing I want to solve. Looking back, I probably should have reached out. But yeah, you, know, you know, I was in the Marines, I had that pride. I wasn't telling anyone yeah. there's anything wrong with me. Now I talk about it. At the time, like, I'm fine, I'm good, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so Erica, she was in, some, she, her own little serendipity, she, she got into this amazing field. And I started listening, reading about brainwaves. I was fascinated by it, I'd buy books on it. And I'd do my own work on it, I'd, I'd feel better. And then about... And then can you explain a little bit when you did your own work, like what did that entail? So when you start brain training, you, you start off with a brain map almost always and a QEG brain map. And it's also interesting being who I am and probably many people like me. There's no way to see psychologists or anything like that, but a brain map, okay, let's look and see what's yeah. going on there. And I received a brain map and what it said is I had high beta waves in the posterior of my brain. And basically, this is a signature for anxiety, PTSD, insomnia, and then comes the training part. So then I would target those brain waves and train them down. Um, How do you do that? How do you train? So there's many different methods, but the most common method, the neuro, the field we call neurotherapy or modulation. Neurofeedback is the most used technology. Um, you put electrodes on the scalp. And those, those electrodes read brain waves you have delta, theta, alpha, and beta. And beta are the high brain waves, fast brain waves. Yeah. So you have too much of those in certain parts of your brain and cause anxiety, anxiousness. Um, so instead of like going to talk therapy and spending years you know, addressing these issues, I was able to directly go to those brain waves and train that down. Mm. And there's many different parts to it, there's many different ways you can go about it. Um, but I started feeling more relaxed. And over time, you can learn how to train meditation or what we call alpha theta, these deep hypnagogic states where you take people into the subconscious. The subconscious is the place of healing. The subconscious is the place of where trauma is stored. Mm. Um, when we take people down there, they can, much like plant medicines, they can release trauma. Um, it's also a place of creativity. It's really, because yeah. most people think that we just have like waking consciousness and sleep, but we have all these different degrees in between and the modern mind mostly has lost touch with that, or our ancient ancestors did. I believe our ancient ancestors didn't have these same problems that we do today because they probably had shamanic methods, whether shamanic drumming or plant medicines yeah. to release these traumas. Um, and what ayahuasca is doing in Peru, we're doing a different way through technology. So we train the brain one, to become more efficient, to regulate, to synchronize networks. When your brain's more efficient, everything goes easier. Yeah. And if some area is um, highly dysregulated, and it's beautiful, there's a book called The Symphony of the Brain. For, it's a very introductory book, but it really is a symphony. You allow those brain waves to synchronize, and you can see them aligning, yeah. and you see that brain becoming healthier just through the brain waves. And a lot of times, those past challenges, those challenges that people had, there's emotional problems, anxiety, depression, 
they just kind of go away because your brain's more efficient. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of times people might have, like, say, ADD. They can't focus. Well, there's a brainwave pattern. They have high theta waves in the frontal cortex or, you know, low beta, and we can train those things. So everything's a brainwave pattern. Okay. Um, what we specialize is the spiritual brain waves. That's what I'm interested in. Yeah. But I guess we'll yeah. get to that. And you're talking we, like, let's talk about your company. Yeah. And, and you know, I'll let, I'll let you introduce introduce the name and, and you know, talk about what you're doing there. So, yeah, um, to backtrack a little bit how I got here with the company, a year and a half, I came down. Well, so three years ago, I met my mentor, Dr. Suter. Yeah. Um, maybe a little more than now. And I met him at a neurofeedback conference. I just showed up. I read all the books, but I, I was a nobody at the time. No one knew who I was. But it's a still very small field. Yeah. And I've heard there's about 5,000 practitioners in the world, playing more than that now. And there's probably about, there's about 500 people at the conference. So I was able to meet the PhDs, the scientists, the people with the books, the people in the technology. And one person I met was Dr. Suter. And he was a top guys in the field I didn't know at the time. I explained to him like, hey, I'm thinking about combining plant medicines and ayahuasca with like neurofeedback and brain training. And he goes, I've been waiting to meet, waiting to meet someone like you. I'll train you. Um, kind of like floored, like, well, I guess I've been waiting wow. to someone like you, you know? <laughs> and I found out, he tells me he's also a master of Zen and he's studying mm. spiritual methods. He was involved in the sixties and became interested in psychedelics back then. So he's been around the block, he's 74 years old. And um, for him, he looks to fusion in many people in the field that through this brain training, we can change the world, especially the West, because the Western mind often doesn't have the time or doesn't think as a time to sit and meditate and do these kind of things. Yeah. Um, but with these technologies, the ideas can get there faster. I think the evidence is that we can do that because we can show the brain exactly what brainwave it needs to meditate. Yeah. And it's basically opera conditioning. You show it and the brain responds. Um, so I met Dr. Suter and I looked him up. I didn't even sure who he was. And it turns out he has his own company called New Mind Technologies and he has over 500 clinics using his technology. Wow. I'm like, is this really going to happen? Is he really going to train me? He seems like a busy guy. Yeah. But um, so, well, yeah, every two weeks we got on a zoom call and we went over brain maps and he had a lot of fun with that too he goes well luke this is you know i train a lot of people but for you this is special because it's kind of like a hobby for me too so we're going to look at the spiritual side of these things um i don't go over this with everybody because most people are going to clinical work which is great but we're also doing the spiritual side of brain waves which you know um i think much more unique in the field which i'm really happy to be part of and it's through his help and mentorship that I'm able yeah. to do this. Um, so that was about three years ago. I came back to Peru right when it opened up after the COVID lockdowns. And I did a five-week dieta in the jungle. Really strong dieta. Um, after that dieta, I felt totally cleansed. Two yeah. years, everything going on. That dieta really helped me out. And then I came to the Sacred Valley. And I've been here since, and I've been doing um, neurofeedback training. And before it was just me, yeah. I was just by myself. And I did a ceremony in Waran, this town next door, with this couple named Safa and Felix, who are amazing shamans that I highly recommend. And you know, during the ceremony, I had this idea come to me that, you know, Luke, you're just one man here. We can build something because I have I have my talents. But I know other people with different talents, and um, our mutual friend Holly came to mind. She's been in the field for ten years. She's worked with forty years of Zen in Seattle, a really high level um, neurofeedback institution that does spiritual training. And <clears throat> I thought about her during the ceremony. I'm like, well, Lou, you haven't talked to her in like nine months, and she's at forty years of Zen. Like that's at the highest end place in the world. There's no way she's come down help you out or anything that's it's a nice thought <laughs> and then the next day she calls me up right after she goes hey luke i'm coming down to peru i'm like well holly i'm you know what i'm doing down here don't you just no well, i'm doing neurofeedback training i want to train spiritual brain waves it's like 
well, Luke, that's what I want to do too. And just that synchronicity, like that brought us together. Um, so she came down for two different times and she, it's interesting because there's different parts of the field. So yeah. she does different machines. She knows different kinds of technologies. She specializes in STEM, PMF, like, you know, more nuanced. Whereas I'm like the bread and butter, neurofeedback research, 30 years of research and tried and proven. Yeah. And, and Kali's more to more exotic technologies. So it was really fun um, collaborating with her and she came down and showed me her side of the field. And she has an amazing way with clients and she has an amazing way with really seeing the brain. I think a lot of times in the field, we really look at um, dysregulation or something being wrong, but she was really able to find like the special sparks in every yeah. brain. And it really made me look at things differently. And so now we look at a brain and we want to find those special pieces to train because everyone has that special spark. Um, we have a friend, she's a clairvoyant and energy healer. And we go through with Holly's mentor um, over a Zoom call about her brain. And we're going through the raw brain waves. We find these little gamma waves and I think of certain locations in the frontal cortex. And the idea is to improve her brain, to make it, to improve her gift, yeah, yeah. better clairvoyant, better healer, we can train those gamma oh, waves. Wow. And that's what's so beautiful about it. Like, you know, these people that are gifted and we go, okay, here it is. We found a little signature in their brainwave. Let's train it. So Let's you, make you better. You can use technology to train the shaman and the healers to be even stronger. Correct. That's the theory. And I think we're doing it. And we're part, a lot of it's research too. Yeah. But everything is a brainwave. Um, I think when you look at, I love the field and I love the space of plant medicines, but often it gets to a place where like it's, there's no way you could possibly understand it. Yeah. I think there is a sacred place for a soul and that personal experience, but you know, it's sometimes like there's a brainwave for everything and we can learn about these things. Yeah. And we had you this week for the, the secret creativity retreat yeah. uh, before the ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh, before the workshops and then after the ayahuasca ceremonies and the workshops and then we also did Campbell before all that and you know like it was really uh, awesome to watch you like do your work take the the brain maps before take the brain maps after and and just see the improvements yeah. and and you know from the it was normalization and plasticity yeah like everybody had some improvement yeah it was amazing like is this something that you know in your work like as you're getting more data from you know the retreats and people yeah. you work with like what are you seeing well we're seeing a lot and it's a big field to look into and there's so many different plant medicines and um but the biggest thing we're seeing is we're seeing lots of neuroplasticity we're seeing lots of changes in the brain and in some ways, we might still have more to research and figure out exactly what's going on. Um, but in some ways, we're seeing mood changes. We're seeing improvements in energy levels, efficiency. Um, I think someone had a, you know, yeah, one, one person coming through had a head trauma. And we saw the inflammation go down significantly yeah. through the work and the process of ayahuasca and other modalities we've been doing here. Yeah. Um, she also said, Interestingly, the shaman worked specifically on her brain. She remembers that mm -hmm. in the left hemisphere, I think she said. So these are also interesting things. I have to make notes like, okay, shaman work here, you know, and um, it's very fascinating because we've seen this in a short period of time, massive, massive changes in brain plasticity yeah. and, and things that usually would take like three or four months of like brain training to get. Yeah. Um, we don't know yet how long that stays. Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah. That. And that's hopefully part of the research that we'll do in the future. Um, I think a lot of times there's a certain belief in the field that these plant medicines, like there's massive changes in neuroplasticity, but it's more random. Mm -hmm. And we, when we're changing the brain, it's much more directed. Um, I don't think it's all completely random because I think these shamans are doing, they're working energy fields, they're changing yeah. things. So I think you probably have a little both. Um, so I think a lot of times we're seeing these effects. Um, we're seeing right now we look at timelines too. So we're seeing a pre-map and post-map like really quick. So 
eventually over time we like to do like a three month out yeah. brain map to see is that baseline cat and match out questionnaires you know are they are they retaining the experience yeah. where they're at um no, that's big if you yeah. if you can do that do like three months six months a year or if, if you have guests that actually come back right you know a year a year from now yeah um and you can do brain mapping again yeah. and have, have you had any chance or like even one person where you've been able to do like a three month or six i mean you could do that on yourself i guess yeah no i have not yet um and I think it's someone we would do that with. We want like a, a brand new person coming do it, yeah. coming through and trying the medicine the first time. Because so I would guess that's probably the most significant changes. Yeah. Um, so if we control, I think we'd want to do more than one person. And actually, so we're part a company that does brain training, brain mapping, we're, and then we're part research. Because um, the data we're getting is very valuable. And there's been a lot published in ayahuasca, but there's also a lot that can be published. I don't think hasn't published larger studies yeah. over time, like we're talking about. Um, and there's all kinds of more interesting plant medicines down here too that we can research. And we can also find what kind of brain training goes well to plant medicines. Mm, yeah. And I don't think this has been researched a whole lot. Mm. Um, and we might find all kinds of different modalities. Um, I have my favorites, but we know I've another practitioner in our field there's, that works with psychedelics. He talks about that people who do neurofeedback training before they come down have much more powerful experiences. And I could see that because it makes sense. When you're, mm. when you're doing brain training, you're, you're strengthening networks to the brain. You're yeah. opening channels up. So lots of times psychedelics and shamanism, as powerful as it is, it's often a shortcut. But if we train these networks so to reach these higher levels of consciousness through meditation, we're actually trained networks. Mm. That means new neurons are being created, new myelin sheets, you know, new networks are being created to reach that state. That's great. You, yeah. So you could have a, a protocol where as part of preparation, you do brain training right. before the actual retreat. Right. Uh, so yeah. That reminds me about the cat story you told me. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah. So... I was talking about last night <laughs> and like little stories of the neurofeedback field but it's famous in the neurofeedback field yeah. how it started someone asked me like well has someone done this done this with animals or have i like, well i haven't done it with animals but one of the famous stories in the field is with cats so in the 60s um they learned they can train a certain brain wave called smr on cats it's just a relaxed concentration brain wave and they reward the cats with like milk and a little bit of broth the cats themselves were able to train this brainwave up. Okay, cool. They just tried to figure, to see if they could do it. They didn't know what it meant, but they, knew, they figured out they could actually train brainwaves in animals. Yeah. Well, then um, stuff like this happened back then. I don't think it happens as much today, but they uh, NASA had a certain rocket fuel, and this rocket fuel was toxic at certain amounts. So they wanted to know the lethal toxicity um, because in case this gas or fuel got leaked in the cabin of a rocket yeah. and so they put all these cats in a new study a different just cats in a study and they looked and a certain portion of cats had seizures and died from being exposed to exposed to rocket fuel another section of cats had no problem at all just fine and the scientist doing the study is like what's going on here i don't, I don't understand yeah. and he found out he looked at it all those cats that were just fine were actually the ones that were trained yeah. in that brainwave smr and that's how like we first realized the profound impact of brain yeah. training increases resilience of the brain yeah. and nervous system in many different ways but in this way it was um seizures yeah wow it's it's incredible just to to hear that and that how when did that happen I think it was the early 60s. Early 60s. And to see that, you know, brain training is so powerful, has so much potential, yet <coughs> you still don't hear about it that much. I no. mean, when you're outside the field, and when I was looking at your reports, I'm like, you go deep, you're able to recommend, like, supplements that yeah. people can take to actually help their brain. You're able to see things that maybe uh, people didn't even know about themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and like you, you would think that this is an essential tool. Like if you go to your doctor, yeah, like they should do a brain map. I agree. I think being in the field, 
Um, for any like psychiatrist prescribed meditation, med medication without a brain map would be like a, um, a heart doctor yeah. prescribed medication without taking blood pressure. Yeah. I think it's so critical to understand see what's going on in that brain. And I think because ADD, for example, or anxiety, there's there's like four or five different brain patterns that can cause that problem. Um, but those prescriptions, they don't know by just talking to that person yeah. and what which brain pattern they have. Um, so it's interesting you bring that up because even in the field it's controversial because everyone in the field, I, I met so many great people, but they all believe like we have the special technology does all these amazing things. Um, when's the world going to see it? Because we think it can change yeah. the world. What do you think is, is preventing it from becoming more of a commodity or something that is, you know, as important as, uh, you know, blood pressure, checking yeah. the blood pressure? I think... <laughs> I think there's a lot of reasons. I think one, we have the DSM psychological uh, model that's largely based on medication, mm. prescription drug model, I should say. And this is so ingrained in the health system that we prescribe, we prescribe, we prescribe. Yeah. Um, so most alternative methods aren't really looked at, even though we're having amazing results. Yeah. Um, and most of these amazing results are happening in small, privately funded studies because um, there's no reason for a pharmaceutical company to spend billions of dollars to study neurofeedback. Yeah. Um, pharmaceuticals can scale to large, make millions and millions of dollars. Whereas yeah. neurofeedback is a small practitioner that takes years to study, to learn specialized in brainwaves. It's not really scalable up. So we don't, we don't have that, the billions that pharmaceutical companies have, we don't have the outreach that they have. Yeah. It's much harder for us to educate doctors and people in the health yeah. field, which is unfortunate because, um, I've seen so much massive changes in people that with things that supposedly are untreatable or very hard to treat. Yeah. Um, I've not myself, I've worked with seizures, but I know many people in the field have worked with people that have different kinds of epilepsy and seizures and um, have been vast, vast improvements. Yeah. Like going from severe seizures daily to almost zero, something like wow. that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and then we look at, I think, in the beginning of the field, so new, people don't know what to make of it. And you had two sides of the field. The one side of the field started working with the SMR brainwave I just described before, and they worked with seizures, and that was their special, and ADD and things like this. You another side of the field that look at these alpha waves and theta waves and subconscious meditation, and then rumors start spreading like this is instant enlightenment. And then the healthcare field started looking at that, like those are the crazy guys over there, stay away from them. Um, but I think we're having a resurgence, just like psychedelics are having yeah. resurgence. We're seeing like this, this new age, because the evidence is building. Yeah. The word's getting out, people are having results. Yeah. Are there ways to, as a consumer, uh, if you want access to this, are there ways to kind of bypass uh, and empower yourself, bypass kind of all, all that, that current um, legacy medical, uh, system and kind of take take control of, of your brain waves. We look at ourselves as coaches. I'm not healing anybody. Yeah. I'm really giving the tools to show your brain how to become more efficient and whatever way you, that person wants. So um, now there's many much there's much more neurofeedback practitioners now, and there's probably one every major city or more. Um, we do brain maps here in Peru. We work with retreats here in Peru. That's our specialty. Yeah. But we also do remote training. So if someone was interested in a home training unit, they could have a home training unit, which is really amazing because this was impossible 20, 30 years yeah. ago. And now we have a much more affordable way to control your own nervous system. Like, and yeah. I think this is the most important thing. Like, we usually take medications and these different things and drugs, but like now we have direct access to relax yeah. your body or you know we do peak performance we do spiritual training i think i think the future of the 21st century will be this 21st century will be a century of consciousness i think yeah. the 20th century the atom bomb or the world yeah. wars but i think 21st century will be a century of consciousness because now we're exploring these things we're seeing things and um i think that's moving in that direction yeah. beautiful what what about the the other tools like the muse or like tools that people can can get on their own like are they helpful at all or? yeah so um there's definitely 
It's a little controversial in the field because <laughs> everyone in the field has their own opinions about yeah. everything. Uh, but yeah, there's like low cost technologies that mm -hmm. that people can do. Muse is a lot of people have great results with Muse. Yeah. Some people would say you probably should get a brain map first before using any kind of yeah. brain training device because you want to make sure you're training the brain waves you need. I think there's yeah. an argument for that. Yeah. Um, but hey, you know, buy a Muse, 200 bucks, try it out, see yeah. if it works for you. But the accuracy is about what number of electrodes or because like the Muse what uh, has a certain amount of accuracy and what you use is much more accurate. Right? Yeah, so I think the Muse is kind of like an entry level device that will help you meditate. Um, but what we do is a much more clinical level. Yeah. And I think you're gonna have much more results with yeah. a clinical level device. Because yeah. we can target um, exactly those areas of the brain that we're, yeah. because the Muse headband is just in the frontal cortex, whereas we can target any area of the brain. Yeah. And most meditative waves are in the uh, posterior location we call PZ, um, but it's right in the back of the head. And that's where meditators, that's where you want those brain waves mm. at. Um, but there's other small devices. There's like um, light entrainment where you can wear certain glasses and mm. it flashes a certain frame weight to entrain your brain. It pushes your brain oh, okay. into like alpha state or beta state. Yeah. And that's very affordable. Yeah. And there is um, uh, TDCS. It's a small, slight electrical current. Um, you put two electrodes on and it goes to the brain and they've had a lot of results with it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'm going to try that right away. <laughs> current in your brain, that's kind of like... Ah. It's a little more controversial. <laughs> uh, I would say that lots of people in the field, most people in the field stick with the neurofeedback. Yeah, yeah. But some people are playing around with mm. the different kinds of technology. That's cool. It sounds like you're getting results. Yeah, so. no, that's great. Um, and I, as you were talking, I was like, you know, one of the other big benefit of, of the work that you're doing is when you see the report and you see what's going on in your brain, it brings some, some level of validation for yeah. things you might have been feeling that you can quite put your finger on yeah or and that validation is really important um because i think a lot of times especially for what happens in the brain some people are like am, am i imagining this yeah. am i going crazy you know like why is this happening to me and and seeing the report you can actually explain like this is what's happening in your brain and and you know i could when I, I saw you explaining that to to the to our guests in the retreat, I was like, they were like, "Oh yeah, that, like that that makes sense," you know. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's another benefit that that it is. I think it's very rewarding from my side of things when I can show them their brain map and express it to them, like, "Hey, this is what's going on," and they resonate with it. Yeah, that's so fun for me yeah. because then you know this isn't just uh, a mental experience or experience they just had in their head like this it's manifesting and look yeah. at this, this packet we give them and see what's going on i think it's very empowering oh, yeah. and i remember one of the guests that in the in the ayahuasca ceremony she was like wow i really felt the the shaman working on on this part yeah and and then afterward you show the brain map i was like yeah you know? no yeah it was interesting because like uh, exactly where she said those the yeah. shaman was working was yeah. Um, a healthy outcome. Yeah. The, the brain became more regulated where inflammation went down. Yeah, wonderful, so, yeah. wonderful. Well, we're almost at time. Okay. Um, I've got one uh, kind of boilerplate question I ask every guest. Yeah. Um, and it, the question is, if you had to capture the essence of leadership in a totem, in an animal, uh, or plant, or something, and, and I use leadership in the broad sense of somebody who can actually manifest a future, better future for themselves, for their family, for their community. Yeah. Like, is there something, some animal that you resonate with, or some plant um, that is like, wow, that's like, that that's leadership for me? Hey, interesting question. I've got some examples. I mean, some people pick mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think there's a... I think our ancestors always look at animals with certain characteristics, and it brings me to that. Um, the wolf is a famous one, yeah. and I, for me, I think like a an elk, elk. the nobility of an elk. Um, yeah. I think that resonates with me yeah. for leadership. Yeah, that's beautiful. There's a strength, nobility. Yeah. And I don't know how elks work with each other, but I'm sure it's. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> I see a image now. But, you right. know, I can see I can see the leadership there. Well, um, Luke, is there anything else you, you wanted to cover? Questions you wish I had asked? Um, well, it's been great working with your retreat. It's been a lot of fun. Mm, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. So thank you. And um, 
look forward to doing this again. Yeah. And if anyone wants to reach out about neurofeedback or yeah. what we're doing down here, just send me a message or anyone interested. Yeah. So I'll, we have a lot of projects going awesome. on. Awesome. I'll put all that information in the, in the show notes right, so cool. people can find you. All right. Sounds all right. good. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please subscribe to it on Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Instagram at leadershipadelics or stop by my website and say hi at fuyat.com. That's F-O-O-Y-A-D. There's a lot going on and I'd love to hear from you all, the listeners that tune in every week. And, and if you have suggestions for future guests, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm there and uh, I'd love to get more guests on the show. Thank you. Have a great day.